Hi there. Welcome to the next course. I'm Emily, a UX researcher at Google, and I'll be your instructor. Before we get started, how about a quick recap of what we've covered so far? We started with the basics. You learned why user experience is so important and your role as an entry-level UX designer. Then you were introduced to common tools, frameworks, and platforms used in UX design. And we walked through the steps of a design sprint. Before too long, you were thinking like a designer and started developing your portfolio, personal brand, and online profiles. Everything you've learned so far has given you a solid foundation that we'll continue to build upon. Over the next several videos, you'll learn how empathy is key to creating phenomenal experiences for our users. Every activity you do will bring you closer to empathizing with your potential user. You'll also learn how designers predict what a user or group of users might think as they interact with your product. And more importantly, you'll be able to anticipate how users might feel about the experience. Next, you'll bring together everything you know about your potential user to define your problem statement. Then, we'll give you tools to ideate solutions to address user problems. Before we dive deeper into what empathy is and how it's applied in UX design, you might want to know a little bit more about me. I've been working in UX research for more than 10 years. Right now, I work on the Google Assistant, where I help families communicate and coordinate so they can focus on what really matters, being together. I've always been interested in understanding how people, and kids in particular, learn. I care about bringing user perspectives into the product development lifecycle, and being a UX researcher lets me do just that. I'm so excited to share my passion for creating great user experiences with you. Let's get to it. Coming up, we'll learn how to empathize with users, build an empathy map, understand user pain points, explore personas, write user stories, identify happy paths and edge cases, discover the benefits of user journey maps, write problem statements and hypothesis statements, and we'll consider how accessibility fits into all of this. So let's get started. My name is Emily, and I'm a senior UX researcher on Google Assistant. What that means is I work with users, primarily kids and families, to understand how we can make Assistant even better for them. There are a lot of ways that I conduct research in my job, but I'm primarily a qualitative research, which means I do a lot of interviews. I do a lot of talking in depth with kids, parents, families of all kinds. Sometimes I'm in their home observing their lives and how technology actually fits into their space. And sometimes we're having conversations in one-on-one -on -one interviews in person. I work with designers in a lot of different ways. There are formal ways that we work together through meetings and you know, team efforts. We do a lot of design sprints, but I also like to work with designers in informal ways, just chatting in the hallway or coming to each other with ideas for things that I've heard in research that I'd love to build out or designs that they're creating that they wanna get a family perspective on. I think the power of user research has come through most clearly to me when I kept trying to tell my engineers about kids' developmental levels. I'd say, we need to change this feature because kids can't always read. And I kept pushing on this, but the engineers just didn't see that. They didn't quite understand it because we were operating from two different knowledge bases with two different goals. So I invited them to research and I put our app in front of a seven-year-old girl. And as she's going through the app, you can see her frustration. And I said, what would you do next on this screen? She said, I don't know. And I kept pushing and she kept saying, I don't know, till finally she said, I can't read. All of the engineers in the back room had a new appreciation for research, for our users, and really learned to empathize with our user through research. Let's shift gears and talk about user experience research. Because I'm a UX researcher, I'm particularly looking forward to this section. Coming up, we're going to talk about how user experience research fits into the development of a product, common types of UX research methods and their benefits and drawbacks, and biases in UX research. As we get started, it's important to keep in mind that the role of a UX designer can look very different at different companies. At a larger company like Google with thousands of employees, 
UX designers often have a dedicated user experience research partner, so designers don't have to do much research themselves. But at a smaller company, one UX designer might be responsible for both the UX research and the UX design. That's why it's so critical for you to learn how to do both parts of the job. Plus, having some research skills can be really enticing to companies that are eager to hire new UX designers. Let's start with the basics. UX research focuses on understanding user behaviors, needs, and motivation through observation and feedback. The goal of user experience research is to prioritize the user. We also want to make sure business needs are met. UX research can help bridge the gap between what a business thinks the user needs and what the user actually needs before an expensive and time-consuming product is made. So how does UX research fit into the development of a product? To answer this question, we need to zoom out and revisit the product development life cycle. You may remember that the product development life cycle is the process used to take a product from an idea to reality. User research is a continuous part of the product development life cycle and takes place before, during, and after phase three, design. Research that takes place before anything is designed is usually called foundational research. Some UX teams might also call it strategic or generative research. All three terms mean the same thing, but in this course, we'll stick with foundational research. Foundational research answers the question, what should we build? Additional questions you might ask during this research phase are, what are the user problems? How can we solve them? The goal of foundational research is to help define the problem you would like to design a solution for. This research includes talking with users and identifying their pain points when using a product. And guess what? Sometimes foundational research reveals opportunities no one on the design team would have come up with. Research that takes place during the design phase, phase three, of the product development life cycle is called design research. Some teams call it tactical research, but both terms refer to the same thing. Design research answers the question, how should we build it? Here's a list of things you might want to ask users about during this phase of research. How was your experience using the prototype today? How easy or difficult was it to use? Why? Did you encounter any challenges? The goal of design research is to inform how the product should be built. Design research gives designers a chance to reduce the problems that occur as users interact with your prototype. You can conduct design research very early in the design process when you have paper sketches, or you can wait until you have a prototype to test with users. It just depends on what your key research goals are. The third type of user research is called post-launch research. You might guess that post-launch research only happens at the end of the product development life cycle. Post-launch research can be used to evaluate how well a launch feature is meeting the needs of users. Post-launch research answers the question, did we succeed? The goal of post-launch research is to understand how users experienced the product and whether it was a good or poor user experience. You might also want to check your product's performance against the competition. Next, let's discuss some of the key qualities that UX researchers usually possess. Qualities of a good UX researcher include empathy, pragmatism, and collaboration. Empathy is the ability to understand someone else's feelings or thoughts in a situation. Pragmatism is a practical approach to problem solving. Pragmatic people are focused on reaching goals. Collaboration is the ability to work with a range of people, personalities, and work styles. You already have all of these qualities. All you need to do is learn how to apply them in your work. The more you develop these qualities, the more capable a researcher you can become over time. So keep at it. If you want to specialize as a UX researcher, you'll need some additional training. While our program focuses on UX design, keep in mind that research is always a part of the design process. Next, we'll discuss the types of research methods used for different research questions. Hi again. Now that you know what's involved in user research, let's talk about user research methods. The term methods refers to how you get the research done. There are many different ways to get the answers we need from users, and you'll decide which research method to use based on the questions you need answered. 
Each method has positives and negatives, which we'll cover in another video. Before we jump into each research method, let's cover the basics. There are two ways we categorize research methods. The first way is based on who conducts the research. The second way is based on the type of data collected. So first, let's think about who conducts the research. Primary research is research you conduct yourself. For example, you might interview users, survey users, or conduct a usability study to hear from users directly. Secondary research is research that uses information someone else has put together. Secondary research can be information from books, articles, or journals. You've probably done secondary research before and not even realized it. Did you know looking up the statistics of a sports team counts as secondary research? Most of the time, secondary research is done at the very beginning of the product development life cycle, before any ideation happens. Secondary research is often done by product leads, not UX designers. But the insights they share can help you make a stronger case for your design choices and gain more empathy for your users. Another way to categorize research methods is to think about the type of data collected. Data can be collected through qualitative or quantitative research. Quantitative research focuses on data that can be gathered by counting or measuring. Quantitative research is often based on surveys of large groups of people using numerical answers. This type of research often answers questions like how many and how much. If you want to know how the majority of users are experiencing a product, you should use quantitative research. On the other hand, Qualitative research focuses on observations. Qualitative research is often based on interviews, where we focus on a smaller number of users and understand their needs in greater detail. This type of research answers questions like, why, or how did this happen? If you want to know why users are having a bad experience with your product and how to improve it, you should use qualitative research. Here's a quick way to remember the difference. Quantitative research gives you the what, and qualitative research gives you the why. So now that you know the basics of how we categorize research, it's time to dive into some common research methods. Let's start with interviews. Interviews are a research method used to collect in-depth information on people's opinions, thoughts, experiences, and feelings. Interviews are usually conducted in person and include a series of open-ended questions where the researcher asks the user about their experience. Use interviews when your questions require a detailed response. For example, can you spot the difference between these two questions? How would you rate your experience using the app on a scale of 1 to 10? Versus, how was your experience using the app? The second question is open-ended and allows the user to share more about their experience. Next up, surveys. Surveys are an activity where many people are asked the same questions in order to understand what most people think about a product. Surveys allow us to hear from a larger number of users than we can during interviews. Surveys include a mix of quantitative and qualitative questions. Surveys are most useful after you have some initial understanding of the user's pain points and want to solidify that by surveying a larger number of people. Finally, Let's talk about usability studies. Usability studies are a technique that help us evaluate a product by testing it on users. The goal of a usability study is to identify pain points that the user experiences with different prototypes, so the issues can be fixed before the final product launches. During a usability study, you get a chance to see how your end users interact with your new product or feature and afterwards you can interview the users to learn more about their experience. The usability study data is then used to improve the UX of the design. If the product has already launched, a post-launch usability study might include data like success metrics and key performance indicators, which are commonly known as KPIs. Key performance indicators are critical measures of progress toward an end goal. The KPIs for an app or new product launch might include things like how much time the user spent on a task or the number of clicks they used to make a purchase. You'll learn how to conduct your own usability study soon. 
Now that you know all the research methods, you might be wondering how you can possibly pick one. The key thing to remember is that the research method we choose is decided by the question we are trying to answer. As you start working on a specific project, you'll be able to define the questions that will lead you to the best method. Next up, we'll check out the advantages and disadvantages of the methods we just introduced, interviews, surveys, and usability studies. Hi again. So now you've been introduced to research methods that are commonly used in the field of UX. With lots of different methods to choose from, it can be tricky to know which method to use. We've got you covered. Coming up, we'll go over the benefits and drawbacks of research methods, like secondary research, interviews, surveys, and usability studies. We'll also discuss why you'd choose one method over another. Remember what we mentioned earlier? The research method we choose depends on the question we're trying to answer. If we're just getting started with a project, we might use secondary research to know the stats, facts, and figures that already exist about our users. For example, imagine you're designing a budgeting app. You might want to review historical spending trends of folks in their 20s. Or you may want to learn what these young adults actually spend their money on. Chances are a credible study on this already exists. Finding one can save your team time and money. Plus, why redo work that's already been done? Another cool thing about secondary research is that it's immediately accessible. Usually, all you need is a good internet connection. Last, secondary research can be used to back up your own primary research. If users mention something during interviews, you might want to find secondary research to back it up. But there are also drawbacks to secondary research. Secondary research doesn't allow you to observe users interacting with your budgeting app, so you will not have feedback on how users feel about your product. Next, let's talk about interviews. Interviews allow you to understand what users think and why. During interviews, there is also an opportunity to ask follow-up questions and really understand the user's experience. The main drawback is that interviews take a lot of time and money. This means you'll end up with a small sample size, which can be risky when launching a brand new product. A compromise is surveys. As we learned earlier, Surveys allow us to get feedback from a larger sample size of users. Other benefits of surveys are they are fast and inexpensive. You can hear perspectives from a lot of users very quickly. One big drawback to using surveys is that feedback from users is limited. Survey questions don't allow for in-depth feedback. Last but not least, let's think about usability studies. Usability studies allow us to observe firsthand user interaction with our product. Our designs make sense to us because we are the ones who created them, but that doesn't guarantee they'll make sense to every user. Usability studies keep our assumptions from getting in the way of acknowledging the user's actual experience. In addition, usability studies let the user give in-depth feedback. The drawback to usability studies is that they only measure one thing, how easy the product is to use. Another drawback to usability studies is that they are expensive because you have to bring users into a lab and reimburse them for their time. Finally, how a user interacts with your product in a lab environment is different than how they will actually use it in real life. All right, now you've got a basic understanding of the benefits and drawbacks of four common user research methods. Next, will shift gears and identify biases in UX research. Hi there, my name's Craig and I'm a research manager at Google. Thinking a little bit about like my career path into UX, it was definitely not straightforward. Um, I left university not sure what I wanted to do, not sure what UX was, bearing in mind this was 20 years ago when UX was really like getting going. So my first job, I swept the floors in a gym. That was my first job. Um, but I knew that I was interested in like technology and I knew I had this research qualification, but I wasn't really sure what I needed to do or where I needed to go with that. Eventually I managed to get a job in market research. So market research was like really buoyant at the time, plenty of jobs in market research. 
So I spent a couple of years working for a couple of different organizations, but it always seems slightly removed from actually building products and actually using technology. And a friend of mine made me aware that there was a junior position as a UX researcher in an online gaming company back in the UK. And I managed to get an interview. And I think that person, possibly feeling slightly sorry for me, decided that they were going to give me a go and give me a job. Um, and since then, I haven't really looked back. But it did take somebody who to believe in me that I had the skills necessary to be a great UXR to, to give me that opportunity. In terms of some of the things that really excite me about the job and the role, um, I like spending time on new stuff. Like It's really amazing that within technology, you get a chance to just explore and play with stuff that maybe doesn't even exist yet. And you're trying to think about how you can combine research and insights into that product development process. And you'll work with tons and plenty of other people on that. That's the bit that I still get excited about. It's still the thing that you know, on a Monday morning where maybe the weather isn't great and you've got to get up early and you've had a great weekend, I'm just as excited about getting in and doing that kind of stuff because that's what made me get into this business in the first place. Hi again. Now that you know the basics of user research, let's explore how bias can get in the way. In this video, we're going to discuss how bias specifically affects design work. We'll examine six kinds of biases, confirmation bias, false consensus bias, primacy bias, recency bias, implicit bias, and the sunk cost fallacy. To begin, let's define the word bias. In short, a bias is favoring or having prejudice against something based on limited information. It's like making up your mind about someone before you've really gotten to know them. We all have biases, and they're often unconscious. While we can't completely get rid of biases, we can be more aware of them and work to overcome them. In UX design, this is critical to product success and to your professional development. Everything we've learned so far has shown us that we aren't the user. We've also learned how important it is to put ourselves in our user's shoes when making design decisions. Biases can really get in the way of doing this. Later, we'll get into the details of how this all applies to your work. The first kind of bias to be aware of is confirmation bias. This bias occurs when you start looking for evidence to prove a hypothesis you have. Because you think you already have the answer, you're drawn to information that confirms your beliefs and preconceptions. Let's say you have the preconception that left-handed people are more creative than right-handed people. As you research, you'll tend to gravitate towards evidence that supports this belief, and you'll use it to build your case even though it's not necessarily true. One of the most effective methods for overcoming confirmation bias during research is to ask open-ended questions when conducting interviews. An open-ended question lets the person being interviewed answer freely instead of with a yes or a no. You also want to get into the habit of actively listening without adding your own opinions. That means you aren't leading your interviewees towards the answer that you want them to give. Another way to avoid confirmation bias is to include a large sample of users. Make sure you're not just looking for a small group of people who fit your preconceived ideas. You want to have a big sample of users with diverse perspectives. Next up, let's look at the false consensus bias which is the assumption that others will think the same way as you do. In UX research, the false consensus bias happens when we overestimate the number of people who will agree with our idea or design, which creates a false consensus. It's possible for the false consensus to go so far as to assume anyone who doesn't agree with you is abnormal. You can avoid false consensus bias by identifying and articulating your assumptions. For example, you might live in a community that often identifies with certain political beliefs. 
When you meet a new person, you might assume they share your political beliefs because you both live in the same town. But that isn't necessarily true. Finding a few people who do align with your beliefs and assuming they represent the entire community is a false consensus. That's another reason to survey large groups of people. Another kind of bias that affects designers is the recency bias. That's when it's easiest to remember the last thing you heard in an interview, conversation, or similar setting because it's the most recent. When talking to someone, you're more likely to remember things they shared at the end of the conversation. To overcome the recency bias, you can take detailed notes or recordings for each interview or conversation you have. This way, you can review what people said at the start of the conversation, in case you don't remember. UX designers might also struggle with primacy bias, where you remember the first participant most strongly. Sometimes the first person you meet makes the strongest impression because you're in a new situation or having a new experience. The primacy bias, like the recency bias, is another reason to take detailed notes or recordings. So you can review everything that happened, not just the memorable first impressions. Recency and primacy biases also demonstrate why you should interview each participant in the same way. Consistency makes it easier to compare and contrast over time. And consistency makes it more likely that you'll remember the unusual and important moments that happened throughout your research. The next form of bias we'll cover is implicit bias, which is also known as unconscious bias. Implicit bias is a collection of attitudes and stereotypes we associate to people without our conscious knowledge. One of the most common forms of implicit bias in UX is when we only interview people within a limited set of identity profiles, such as race, age, gender, socioeconomic status, and ability. These profiles are generally based on assumptions we have about certain types of people. For example, Implicit bias might cause you to feel uncomfortable interviewing people whose life experiences are different from your own. On the other hand, we might choose to interview people from typically excluded groups, but then ask potentially offensive questions because of our internalized stereotypes. Both of these scenarios are problematic and lead to a lack of representation in our research and design process. The most important thing to note about implicit biases is that everybody has them. To overcome our biases, we can reflect on our behaviors and we can ask others to point out our implicit biases. That's one of the best ways we can become aware of our biases. The last form of bias we'll cover is the sunk cost fallacy. This is the idea that the deeper we get into a project we've invested in, the harder it is to change course without feeling like we failed or wasted time. The phrase sunk cost refers to the time we've already spent or sunk into a project or activity. For example, you might think to yourself, I might as well keep watching this terrible movie because I've watched an hour of it already. For UX designers, the sunk cost fallacy comes into play when working on a design. You might have invested hours into designing a new feature, but then learn that the feature doesn't really address a user problem. It's easy to keep working on a design that you've invested time into, but ultimately you need to focus on work that positively impacts users. To avoid the sunk cost fallacy, Break down your project into smaller phases and then outline designated points where you can decide whether to continue or stop. This allows you to go back based on new insights before the project gets too far along. You're now familiar with the most common forms of bias in user research. It's important to know that there are other biases we haven't covered here. 
Bias is a limitation that extends well beyond the fields of UX design and user research. They can creep into the ways we make friends, manage projects at work, and communicate with family members. Now that you know about these biases, you might even start noticing them in your daily life. The more that identifying bias becomes a habit, the better you'll get at avoiding bias in your design process. As UX designers, we want to prevent biases from getting in the way of accurate research. You can always refer back to the glossary if you need a refresher about these biases and their definitions. Keep these tips in mind for overcoming biases and you'll be on your way. Hi, my name is Dina. I'm a senior user experience researcher at Google. As a user experience researcher, I really channel the voice of people, their motivations, their desires, their needs, I bring those insights back to my team, which they use to help build new products or improve existing products. Let's talk about bias in user research. That can happen in many ways, in many shapes, in many forms. I'll give one example. In user research, we set out to interview people. What we may not realize is for every person we interview, we're probably excluding someone. And so as a researcher, it's really important to know why we choose to interview certain people over others and who we are excluding and whether or not those we're excluding need to actually be interviewed. One of the products I work on is Google Food Ordering, where we help consumers be able to order food from businesses around them. But along the way, we realized we hadn't really spoken to the merchants since we weren't really directly integrating with them. We didn't speak to them and understand their needs. So we set out to actually do that. Once we uncovered that insight, it was a light bulb moment for us. And we realized we had a great opportunity to build an ecosystem that was going to be equitable for everyone. As a researcher, you uncover so many insights. We take those insights and we're constantly improving on the products that we build. So overall, that solution enabled us to realize that, you know, we need to understand the bigger picture, the whole ecosystem. We need to include all voices when we're designing so that we build a solution that is equitable and fair for all the people who will be impacted as a result. Hey there. Let's take a moment to review what you've learned recently. You started with the basics in understanding the role that UX research plays in the design process. Remember, the goal of user experience research is to prioritize the user. You also examined how UX research fits into the development of a product, including foundational research, design research, and post-launch research. Then, you were introduced to two ways to categorize research methods primary and secondary research, and quantitative and qualitative research. As part of that conversation, you went through the benefits and drawbacks to popular research methods like secondary research, interviews, surveys, and usability studies. Finally, we talked about identifying and avoiding biases. You've come a long way. Keep up the good work. Hi again. We're ready to dig into one of the most important parts of the UX design process, empathizing with our users. In this video, we'll learn what empathy is and how it's applied in UX design. We'll also discuss the importance of understanding user needs, behaviors, and motivations. The best thing designers can do to create good user experiences is empathize. Empathy is the ability to understand someone else's feelings or thoughts in a situation. Empathizing with potential users is important to every step of the design thinking process. First, let's explore what we really mean by empathy. Sure, you have a definition, but when you think about empathy in relation to similar words like pity and sympathy, the meaning can get a little blurry. So let's break it down. When you have pity for someone, you feel sorry for them. But pity usually has condescending overtones. Think about it like this. 
pitiful and pathetic are synonyms. When you have sympathy for someone, you acknowledge their feelings, but you keep yourself from experiencing those feelings. Empathy goes beyond sympathy. When you empathize with someone, you share their mental and emotional experiences. Empathy is at the core of everything we do. Approaching UX research with empathy makes it easier for you to solve the right problem. Like anyone else, UX designers make a lot of assumptions, but UX design is not about solving problems we assume users want solved. It's about solving problems that users actually want solved. When we first meet someone, we may have a lot of assumptions about who they are. As we get to know them, though, we may discover that our assumptions were not so accurate. This is true in UX design, too. We might think we know who a user is and what they need, but UX research reveals who they really are and what they actually need, allowing us to better empathize with the user. One way that we can visualize empathy is by creating an empathy map. An empathy map is an easily understood chart that explains everything designers have learned about a type of user. An empathy map consists of four squares, which show what the user says, does, thinks, and feels. The word user goes in the middle, right where these squares intersect. Now you're ready to fill in the squares. Imagine you're on a team building an app that promises food delivery in 30 minutes or less. Your users test a prototype of your app and you interview them about their experiences. Let's create an empathy map. The top left of your empathy map includes what the user says during the interview. Use direct quotes if you can. For our example, one user, Simone, has ordered food from two of our competitors' apps before, but she isn't loyal to either of them. Simone might say something like, I wish food delivery apps provided more accurate time estimates. We should write this direct quote from Simone in the says square of our empathy map. Next, the bottom left square focuses on what the user does during the interview. We should observe and record the user's physical actions. For example, when Simone interacts with our food delivery app prototype, she refreshes a page multiple times and takes the time to read something carefully. The top right square focuses on what the user thinks. This includes things the user doesn't actually say, but that you can tell through observation. Facial expressions are a great way to understand what a user is thinking. A furrowed brow might indicate that Simone is thinking, this is really annoying. Leaning toward the screen might indicate that she's thinking, this is really hard. Finally, the bottom right square of the empathy map focuses on what the user feels. You can directly ask Simone what she's feeling during the interview, so long as it's done in an open-ended way. For example, you might notice that Simone seems annoyed about navigating in one part of the app. So ask her a question about how she's feeling. For example, how did you feel when you tried to place an order on the app? After the interview, fill in the feel square with these observations. Okay. Now you know why it's important to empathize with users, and you can visually represent that information in an empathy map. Coming up, we'll discuss how to identify user pain points. Welcome back. Earlier, you learned why empathizing is so important. As a UX designer, empathizing is your number one superpower because it helps you spot user problems. Solving user problems is the ultimate goal of UX design. But how do you even know if a problem is really a problem? Let's jump right in. Think about New Year's resolutions. Most of us set goals at the beginning of the year, but how many of us keep those goals? Well, it turns out, not many. 80% of New Year's resolutions fail because they are not clear or we set unrealistic expectations. UX designers face similar challenges when setting goals. To make sure you're tackling something you can impact, Set clear and actionable goals by focusing on user problems. So let's identify those user problems. By now, one thing should be pretty clear. UX design is all about the user. You're always, always designing for the user. But who is the user and what are their struggles? To find out, you need to be a bit of a mind reader. Okay, you don't exactly have to read minds, 
but you do need to use your superpower, your ability to empathize. You need to do research to get into the user's head and understand where they're coming from. You also have to anticipate both the needs that users know they have and the needs they don't know they have. That's weird, right? How do users not know what they need? Well, here's an example. In the heyday of flip phones, customers might have thought they needed a longer battery life, a bigger interface, an easier way to text. But they had no idea they needed smartphones. Most of us didn't even know smartphones were possible. So when Apple introduced the first modernized smartphone in 2007, we were dazzled by all it could do. Having a smartphone quickly turned into a need for so many of us. So if you narrow down everything that a UX designer does into a single role, that role would be problem solver. And solving user struggles or pain points is number one on the list. Pain points are any UX issues that frustrate the user and block the user from getting what they need. Remember the Norman door? If you expect a door to open, it should open. If it doesn't, that's a user pain point. Or how about this one? Ever gone on a company's website to find their customer service info? You click tab after tab, scroll page after page, and you still can't find it? That's a user pain point. Most pain points fall into one of four categories. Financial pain points are user problems related to, you guessed it, money. If you've ever gotten lost in an online article only to be rudely interrupted by a paywall, you know all about these. There are also product pain points. These are usually quality issues related to the product. Norman doors fall into this category. Next up, there are process pain points. These are frustrations that stop the user going from point A to point B. For example, have you ever shopped online and struggled to get the item you want to check out? That's a process pain point, and that could mean the business loses a customer. And finally, there are support pain points. When users interact with your product, they might have questions. If they can't find answers to their questions, they won't feel supported. Customer service information that's hidden on a website falls into this category. Remember when I said designers need to read minds? Well, we also need to read hearts. I think it's safe to say that we've all experienced these kinds of pain points. We know how it feels. As a designer, you need to know how it feels for your user. In other words, you need to have empathy for your user. Think back to the door experiment. Opening the door may not always be easy. What if our user is in a wheelchair? What if they can't reach the knob? What if they don't have enough strength? You want to account for all users. Let's think back to an empathy map. Empathy maps show us what the user thinks, says, does, and feels. Empathy maps help us get into the user's mindset, allowing us to identify their pain points. This is just the beginning. We really want to get to know our users, and that's why designers create user personas. Let's find out what personas are all about. Hey there, and welcome back. Now you know all about user pain points. Next, let's explore personas and why UX designers use them. In UX design, personas are fictional users whose goals and characteristics represent the needs of a larger group of users. Personas can help us identify patterns of behavior in users. These patterns might point to a common pain point that a group of users experiences. While personas are fictional, we don't make these characters up from scratch. We build them based on research. You've got to do your research if you want a set of personas that truly represent your potential users. As you research, you'll form images in your head about who your users are. These will become your personas. Let's build a persona together. First, we'll need to figure out what user group our persona represents. Imagine you're designing a fundraising app that connects nonprofits with volunteers. You do some secondary research and conduct phone interviews with a diverse set of users. Let's say during research, you discover that single professionals in rural areas donate to environmental causes twice as often as single professionals in big cities. You also discover that big city singles are more likely to volunteer than single professionals in rural areas. Based on this, 
one of your user groups might be owners of environmental nonprofits in rural areas. A user group is a set of people who have similar interests, goals, or concerns. Now that we've identified a solid user group, let's build a persona to represent it. Ready? Meet Searing Choadun, founder of OurPlanet.org. As we build the persona, we want to include her photo and a short biographical sketch. Include things like age, occupation, hometown, marital status, and any other demographic data points that might give us a better sense of who our user group is. So imagine that Searing is 35, has a BA in English, and lives in Bellevue, Nebraska with her wife and two rescue dogs. After the bio sketch comes a bit about her professional goals and day-to-day -day duties. As a founder of a nonprofit, Searing probably fills lots of roles, like writing grants and talking with city officials about exciting green initiatives. She also keeps residents informed about how and where to recycle their trash. After that, since you're designing an app, you might want to know how comfortable Searing is at navigating online and working with tech. So let's say she's not so tech savvy, but knows she has to get her nonprofit online if she wants to find more volunteers. Finally, you might want to give her a catchphrase, something she says to inspire herself and her small team every day. For Searing, that might be something like, getting greener every day. And just like that, your user group turns into a real person that the team can build their app around. Keep in mind each persona you create humanizes a user group for your team. Searing represents only one persona. You want to build a persona to represent each key user group, and that will take time. Is it worth it to build so many personas? The short answer, absolutely. Now for the longer answer. Personas build empathy and put a face to the user. They help humanize our users. They give stakeholders a clearer idea of who their users really are and makes the user experience more meaningful. Let's do a little test. When I say to you, there are about 533,000 people over the age of 100 living in the world today, you'll probably find it mildly interesting for a second before promptly forgetting the number. But if I tell you about Mavis Hunter, a competitive runner who only picked up the sport two years ago after turning 100 years old, chances are she makes a longer lasting impression. Why? She makes you feel something the stats can't. She feels like a real person. You want to help her continue to do what she loves. That's the power of personas. In addition, personas tell stories. This is why personas are key to turning an average stakeholder presentation into a storytelling experience. If your client is building a new running app, Mavis helps make the case for creating new features or expanding accessibilities for senior citizen athletes. Okay, so personas build empathy and tell stories. But why do you need a whole set of personas? Well, one persona isn't enough to tell all the sides of a design story. As cool as Mavis is, you aren't improving the running app just for her. This is why you need a set of personas. All user groups should be vividly represented. This shows stakeholders the diversity of their user groups, and it lets you test features against them. This leads us to the third reason for why personas are worth it. Personas stress test designs. Let's go back to the running app. What works for Mavis might not work for Diane, a working mother of three children under the age of five. What matters most to Mavis isn't the same as what matters most to Diane. Mavis wants accessibility, while our working mom wants time. Personas make sure we designers create something that benefits a wide range of users. Now that you know what a persona is, what personas do for UX designers, and how to build a persona, let's get to know how personas help us tell a user story. Hey there. Now that we know all about personas, it's time for some stories. A user story is a fictional one sentence story told from a persona's point of view to inspire and inform design decisions. It introduces the user, lays out an obstacle, and states their ultimate goal. Don't get confused if you notice some designers refer to these as scenarios or user cases. 
they mean the same thing. Now, let's check out the goal, structure, and benefits of user stories. The user story expands on the persona and deepens your understanding of a user group. Here are some cool things a user story can do for you. User stories prioritize design goals. If you have a lot of user needs to consider, user stories determine which ones are the most critical to resolve. User stories also unite the team around a clear goal. A good user story can also inspire empathetic design decisions by making our approach user-centered, also known as user-centric. And finally, user stories personalize pitches to stakeholders. You aren't just presenting your design update ideas, you're demonstrating how the updates will help specific types of people. So, how do you write a user story? Like a classic short story, user stories have a hero with an ultimate goal and a conflict that keeps them from conquering that goal. To write a user story, we follow this simple formula. As a type of user, I want to action so that benefit. All that's left now is filling in the missing pieces. Type of user describes who we are designing for. Action is what the user hopes will happen. And finally, benefit is why the user wants the action to happen. This formula keeps the problem user-centered, actionable, and clear. Let's think about a user story that I experience all the time. As an online shopper, I want to receive a text when the item arrives so that I can pick it up right away. So now you know what a user story is, why it's important, and how it's structured. Up next, you'll learn how to predict and prevent a bad user experience. Welcome back. With user stories, just like any story, there's always a chance that things might not go exactly how you want them. The hero detective doesn't always crack the case, and your user doesn't always reach their goal. Luckily for your user, you can change their experience as the UX designer. When building a new or improved product, the designer's goal is to keep all users on the happy path. The happy path describes a user story with a happy ending. For this user, everything goes as they expect and they reach their goal without issue. Unfortunately for other users, things don't go quite as smoothly. For example, say Isla, a Londoner, wants to buy birthday flowers for her friend Priya in California. She visits the website of a California-based flower shop and sets to work, designing a bouquet of Priya's favorite flowers and writing a meaningful message. Everything is going well. Isla is on the happy path. But when Isla's asked to enter her address, there's a field that asks for her home state. Since Isla doesn't have a home state, she lives in London, England, she tries to skip that field, assuming the site would let her. But the state field is required. She reaches a dead end on the happy path and, after all that work, has to close the website and find another way to get flowers for her friend. In the design world, Isla and others like her are called edge case users. An edge case is what happens when things go wrong that are beyond the user's control. Good UX anticipates edge cases and reroutes users back to the happy path when things don't go as planned. In edge cases, the obstacle is beyond the user's control to fix. Think back to Isla, who only wants to wish her American friend a happy birthday. There is no way for her to skip the state field, so there's no way for Isla to successfully buy Priya's flowers on that shop's site. Unfortunately, Isla's user experience is broken and unrepairable on her end. Let's check out some UX design pro tips for spotting and resolving potential edge cases before the product launches so other users don't end up in Isla's situation. Pro tip one, create personas and user stories. If UX designers make sure their personas and user stories account for a wide variety of users and problems, they can keep even the most vulnerable users on the happy path. Pro tip two, thoroughly review the project before launch. In the rush to launch a product, UX designers might focus only on the happy path. Giving the project a final good review from the user's perspective helps designers identify edge cases. Pro tip three, use wireframes. 
you'll learn how to create wireframes later. Wireframes help visualize the project, which makes it easier to identify potential user pain points and fix them before launch for folks who are not visually impaired. We all have that friend who always has whatever you need when you need it. You're at an amusement park having lunch and dropped your fork on the floor. This friend's got an extra fork ready to go. Need an extra pair of nylon footies to try on some fancy flats? They've got you covered. As a UX designer, you want to be that friend to all users, whether they're on the happy path or not. Okay, so far we've gotten to know our users and their stories. Up next, we'll go on a journey, the user journey. Hey, my name is Ayan, and I am a visual designer at Google. An edge case is a situation within a product experience that uh, the product team doesn't think is very likely to happen, um, or that is without or outside of the typical flow within that product. When you're trying to figure out like what the edge cases are for your product, you really need to actually sit down with users and see how their, their life actually shakes out with your product. Often, what you think is going to happen when your app is in the hands of a user is actually not what happens. And so identifying those cases is really key to creating a harmonious experience when things don't go the way that you plan for them to. An edge case that I've worked on semi-recently, I was the visual design lead on the Messages product at Google. It's our texting solution. And as I was creating that brand, differentiating visually RCS, which is the future of texting, things like typing indicators, versus SMS, somewhat of the passive texting, the typical protocol that you would use to text your mom, let's say. Creating a visual system that would work harmoniously and these two supposedly separate experiences meant that on the off case that your uh, phone loses access, you would still have a harmonious experience. So as a visual designer, I really wanted to make sure that these two spaces that we didn't intend to ever live together still would make sense if it did. And actually, in practice, that happened quite a bit. So when you see screenshots of our texting app, you'll notice that whether or not it's an RCS versus SMS, or maybe a combination of the both, it should still look beautiful. As we were working on this project and really creating a new brand for the Messages app, I worked really closely with product management to come up with a strategic plan so that as this redesign lived out in the wild, so to speak, we had a plan for the years to come. And so while RCS was our big bet for the future, we wanted to make sure that the SMS reality of that time uh, was, would be harmonious as our product matured over the years. So identifying future use cases versus current use cases uh, really helped us identify these edge cases that would be prevalent current day that maybe wouldn't be so prevalent in our hopeful future. I get so proud when I see screenshots of text message conversations out there on social media and sometimes you see SMS with RCS, that light blue bubble with that dark blue bubble. And I'm proud to say that we identified that edge case before it became an issue for our brand perception. Now that you've planned and prepared for happy paths and edge cases, let's discover what user journeys are all about. A user journey is the series of experiences a user has as they interact with your product. User journeys build off the personas and stories you've already created. They help you think and feel like the user, which is super important. If you can't put yourself in the user's shoes, you can't be sure your design will really help them. Before you start the user journey, you need a journey map. A journey map is just what it sounds like, an illustration of what the user goes through to achieve their goals. Think of reading a book. If the persona is your character, the user story is your plot, and the journey map is your story outline. First, let's do a little experiment. Imagine we want to drive to the beach for a swim. We can pull up a map on our phone to get an overview of the best route. We know our starting point and our end point. So let's go for a drive. So far, so good, right? Oops, looks like a traffic jam up ahead. Luckily, the Map app gives us a detour route to avoid the traffic. Map apps help drivers avoid obstacles along their route. The same idea applies to journey maps. 
A user journey map helps UX designers create obstacle-free paths for users. That's the first benefit to user journey mapping. Now let's go over some more. A user journey map reduces the impact of designer bias, which you might remember as the tendency for the designer to design according to their own needs and wants instead of the users. Creating a journey map lets you thoroughly detail the user's interaction with your design. That way you can really focus on how a specific persona, not you, thinks and feels at every step. Journey mapping also highlights new pain points. For example, say your persona, Kindred, is biracial. Her user journey is filling out her census info online. Everything is going well until it's time for Kindred to select her race from the drop-down menu. Suddenly, she hits a roadblock. There's no option for her to identify herself as both Black and Korean. That's a pain point. If you yourself aren't biracial, you might not have predicted this problem. But by creating the persona of Kindred, giving her a story, and mapping out her journey, you are able to clearly identify the issue and correct it. Which brings us to the final key benefit of journey mapping, identify improvement opportunities. In Kindred's example, you could add an option in the menu for users to write in their racial identity. Or maybe you could add another field to the drop-down menu for multiracial citizens. Improving the UX here can make a big difference. So how do we map out a user journey? One action at a time. Let's say our persona, Jamal, comes from a town of 500 people in rural Mississippi. He uses a wheelchair to get around, and he's visiting New York City for the first time. Today, he wants to fulfill his dream of going all the way to the top of the Empire State Building. How do we map out his journey? To start, identify the first task the user needs to complete. In this case, Jamal needs to find a subway route that will take him to the Empire State Building. Next, list all the things the user needs to do to reach their goal. Here's a list of Jamal's main tasks. Task one, determine the subway line and route to take. Task two, find the nearest station with wheelchair accessibility. Task three, buy a ticket. Task four, find the right platform and make sure the train is headed toward the Empire State Building and not away from it. Task five, board the subway. Task six, find the right exit. The next action in mapping a user journey is describing all the smaller things the user must accomplish before graduating to the next main task. Here's what that might look like for Jamal. So that's it, right? You got Jamal all the way to the Empire State Building. Your work here is done. Well, not exactly. You've completed Jamal's physical journey, but you still need to consider his emotional journey too. The third action in mapping a user journey is identifying the user's likely emotion as they go from task to task. For example, imagine how Jamal might feel the first time he looks at the subway line map. He might be confused or intimidated. Or imagine that Jamal purchased his ticket and is trying to get to the right platform. He can't use the stairs, so he'll need to find an elevator or ramp. The elevator might not be working, so he has to find a ramp. This experience could make Jamal feel overwhelmed and make him feel excluded. There's one final action in our journey mapping exercise. Once we've identified the user's emotions, we can then identify opportunities to improve his user experience. This is where user journey mapping can really enhance UX design. Without mapping the actions of Jamal's journey, it might never have occurred to us to add signage in subway stations to help users with wheelchairs navigate the system more easily. Here's what a completed user journey map looks like for Jamal. Now you know how user journeys build off of user stories and personas. You also know the benefits of user journey maps, and you understand how to create a journey map. Jamal's user journey may have come to an end, but we've still got a long way to go in our UX design journey. Coming up, we'll highlight the importance of considering accessibility. Hi again. You just learned about personas, user stories, and user journeys.
I'm here to help you learn how to consider accessibility in each of these. Why do we need to consider personas, user stories, and user journeys of someone with a disability? Well, people with disabilities share the same goal for any given user problem that your design is trying to solve. Additionally, accessibility is not just designing to include a group of users with varying abilities. Instead, it extends to anyone who is experiencing a permanent, temporary, or situational disability. Designing with accessibility in mind means making sure Betty, a user with only one arm, Angela, a user with a sprained wrist, and Juan, a user holding a colicky newborn, all have everything they need to stay happily on their user journeys. Betty's disability is permanent, Angela's is temporary, and Juan's is situational but they all need to achieve their user goal with only one hand. You want to design products that can be used by everyone. As UX designers, we don't want to leave Betty, Angela, or Juan behind. It's critical to understand how a person with a disability might have a slightly different journey due to the fact that their needs may not have been addressed during the initial design process. Sometimes not addressing those needs can have serious consequences. Consider fire safety escape routes. Usually people are advised to use the stairs to exit a building during a fire. But what about people who use wheelchairs to get around? They're not considered in those evacuation plans and maps. Accessibility should matter to all of us. Start familiarizing yourself with the experience that people with a disability might have when using digital products. It's important to have conversations with people with disabilities and immerse yourself in the assistive technology that they might use. Learning more about assistive technologies might mean watching videos of experts using them. There are plenty of videos out there demonstrating just that. Or you could even try an assistive technology yourself. Keyboard interaction models serve as a great starting point for understanding the basic interaction patterns of ATs. You might generally use a mouse pointer with your computer and not realize that there are moments when you rely on keyboard instead. For example, when you're filling out a form like this, you might use your mouse to navigate to a new form field like name then you might press enter or return on your keyboard to submit the form instead of clicking the button with your mouse. Some people rely solely on the keyboard to interact with websites at all times. So all websites need to support keyboard input and navigation to comply with the requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act. By doing so, you also enable other ATs like switch devices, to properly interact with the same website. It's impossible to overstate the importance of designing for accessibility. UX designers empathize with their potential users, which includes people with disabilities. Coming up, we'll explore how designing for accessibility can end up benefiting everyone too. See you there. Hi again, wanna hear a fun fact? One of the first curb cuts in the U.S. was installed in Michigan in 1945. You've probably used a curb cut yourself. A curb cut is a name for the slope of the sidewalk that creates a ramp with the adjoining street. Curb cuts are usually found at intersections. Thanks to curb cuts, people with wheelchairs, leg braces, or crutches can navigate their neighborhoods with a lot more freedom. But funny thing, the benefits of curb cuts extend to everyone, from people pushing strollers to bicyclists, movers, and elderly people. Chances are curb cuts have helped you too. Curb cuts have become such a popular example of designing for accessibility that there's now a whole concept named after it. The curb cut effect is a phenomenon that describes how products and policies designed for people with disabilities 
often end up helping everyone. Let's check out some more examples of this effect. Today, most crosswalks in major cities across the United States come equipped with signals that indicate that it's safe for someone to cross the street. There's a visual signal, like a symbol of a person walking. There's an auditory signal, like a series of beeps. The auditory signals even speed up to let people with vision disabilities know that their time to cross the street safely is ending. And there's a tactile signal, like the bumpy blister paving on the sidewalk's curb. The physical sensation of the tactile paving indicates that they've safely made it to the next sidewalk. But these signals help everyone. Think about a sighted person who is focused on something other than the crosswalk, like a new text message. The sequence of beeps and the textured ground designed to help people with vision disabilities will help the distracted person too. Or consider this, if you've ever broken your leg, you know how challenging it can be to do everyday things like go down a flight of stairs. When you design features for someone with a permanent limited mobility, like elevators, power lifts, or wide aisles to accommodate wheelchairs, you'll end up helping an even broader range of users. Similarly, if you're a sighted person who has tried to watch a breaking news story on TV in a noisy bar, chances are you've been helped out by closed captioning. You don't have to hear the news anchor as long as you can read what they're saying. And since closed captioning is multilingual, users who aren't fluent in the language being spoken can understand what's being said by reading closed captioning in their native language. Now, let's think about products and services that are inaccessible. As a security measure, many websites automatically time a user out if they haven't been active for two minutes. However, we live in a world full of neurologically diverse people who might need more time filling out a form or reading text. Designing for inclusivity and accessibility may mean removing or lengthening this time window. If you do that, you'll help people with neurodiversity, multitasking parents, senior citizens, and even the folks who need more time to find their credit cards. All these people would benefit from either removing the timer, extending the amount of time allowed, or a timer that prompts users with a visual or sound notification when their time is running low. To wrap up, let's recap what you've learned. As we considered the experiences of users with disabilities, we discovered how designing for people with disabilities can benefit everyone. Coming up, you'll learn how to define a problem statement. Hi again. Remember the design thinking process? So far, we've been focused on the empathize phase. All of our work on empathizing with the user will help us define the problem, which is where we're at now, moving from the empathize phase into the design phase. As we've discussed, design exists to solve users' problems. To start defining the design problem, we'll need to synthesize everything we've learned in the empathize stage, including pain points, personas, user stories, and user journeys. Also, empathy maps can help us focus on the user's needs and problems they are experiencing. So let's get started. It's the moment we've been waiting for. Drum roll, please. We're ready to write a problem statement. A problem statement is a clear description of the user's needs that should be addressed. Problem statements align the team on which user problem to focus on, giving everyone a clear goal. A strong problem statement is human-centered. It should be broad enough to allow for some creative freedom, but narrow enough that it can actually be solved by a design solution. Problem statements can be written using a simple formula. Start with the name of the user. Add a short description of the user's characteristics. Clearly describe the user's need and explain why the user has that need. In other words, an insight about the user. For example, Amal is the name of the user. His user characteristic is that he's an athlete. His user need is that he wants to sign up for a workout class. And the insight, or why he has the need, is that the workout classes are filling up quickly. 
So what can we learn from an effective problem statement? First, problem statements help us establish goals. An effective problem statement tells you what the user really needs. Defining the goal clearly and concisely gets everyone on the design team on board and focused on the same thing. Second, problem statements help us understand constraints. We want to know what's keeping users from satisfying their needs. Third, problem statements help us define deliverables. When we finally solve the problem, what will we have to show for it? It's helpful to know what our solution will produce. And finally, problem statements help us create benchmarks for success. How will we know when we succeed? If your goal is to open a door, for example, you'll know you've succeeded when you can see what's behind the door. Most design problems will be more complicated than opening a door, but the benchmark for success should be just as straightforward. All right, you nail down your problem statement. What happens next now that the problem is clearly defined? Well, think about how this happens in your own life. Let's say you're a barista who needs to find an affordable moving company because you are moving across the country. If this is the problem you're facing, you would brainstorm possible solutions. Brainstorming solutions is similar to making a hypothesis or an educated guess about how to solve the problem. In UX design, we write possible solutions to the problem as hypothesis statements. A hypothesis statement writes out our best educated guess on what we think the solution to a design problem might be. So how do we write hypothesis statements? Unlike problem statements, there's not a standard formula to use for writing hypothesis statements. But to get us started, we'll try what's known as an if-then statement. It looks like this. If, name an action, then name an outcome. Let's go back to our earlier example with Amal. Amal is an athlete who needs a way to sign up for workout classes because the class he wants to participate in fills up fast. Your hypothesis statement might be something like this. If Amal downloads the gym's app, then he can reserve his favorite class in advance. Like we said, hypothesis statements don't have a standard formula. So instead of using an if-then statement, you could also write this hypothesis statement as something more flexible, like Amal needs an app that allows him to reserve his favorite classes in advance and notifies him of the first opportunity to sign up. In both of these examples, we are guessing or hypothesizing what has to happen for Amal's need to be solved. As you move forward in the design process, you will revisit and possibly adjust your hypothesis as you learn more about your user's needs. Be flexible and adapt as you go in order to end up with the best design solution. Welcome to Psychology in Design. After all our discussions about empathy and understanding the user, you're probably not surprised to learn that psychology is a big deal in UX design. Nearly everything is designed to fit humans, from pants pockets to electric cars. But that wasn't always the case. Believe it or not, it took two world wars for designers to consider what we now call the human factor. The human factor describes the range of variables humans bring to their product interactions. Before World War I, the objective was to fit the human to the machine. When planes started being used in war, that changed. Suddenly, untrained soldiers had to learn how to fly. Aviation psychology was introduced and an attempt was made to mold the machine to fit the human. Unfortunately, in the early 1900s, the technology just wasn't good enough yet. During World War II, the sheer number of men and women needed for the war effort made it impossible to choose specific people for specific tasks. Aviation design had to consider human factors. In this case, human factors were the pilot's varying skill levels. If we were robots, some computer genius could just program us to be expert flyers. But we're only human, and not everyone flying a warplane was an ace pilot. To account for this human factor, we had to adapt the plane to the pilot. And by World War II, we finally had the tech to do it. So what are some of the human factors that inform design? Here's a few of the most common ones. Impatience, limited memory, 
needing analogies, limited concentration, changes in need, needing motivation, prejudices, fears, making errors, and misjudgment. For an example of design that considers these factors, all you need to do is check your email. The business email shorthand, TLDR, has really caught on in the last couple years. It's an acronym you might find at the start of a very long email. A TLDR is a short, succinct summary that only gives you the email highlights you really need to know without any excess content. So what does TLDR stand for? Too long, didn't read. The email writer factors in the human tendencies of impatience, limited concentration, need for motivation, and limited memory. Not bad for four little letters. Here are psychological concepts that can help you design with the human factor in mind. Mental models are internal maps that allow humans to predict how something will work. When you face a door, your mental model tells you that the door can be opened. Once the door is opened, you'll be able to leave the room. The process of opening the door is expected to end with you being able to leave the room. A mental model breaks when you can't go through the open door because, for example, there's a solid brick wall behind it. The next psychological concept is feedback loops. Feedback loops refer to the outcome a user gets at the end of a process. For example, if you enter a dark room and flip a light switch, the room will either brighten or it won't. Positive feedback would be the light coming on, while negative feedback would be nothing happening. The more positive feedback a user gets when completing the action, the more they will expect the outcome to be positive. The same is true with negative feedback. If your user takes an action, it's important that they get some kind of confirmation that the action worked or that it didn't. In spite of all the limitations the human factors puts on UX designers, it also gives us opportunities to create even better user experiences. Sometimes a well-known brand will revert their product packaging back to the original design in order to connect to a user's sense of nostalgia. For example, a potato chip company might reissue its classic bag design from the 80s, or a century-old soda company might create replicas of bottles they used decades ago. In these cases, the designer uses nostalgia to connect with users, something they couldn't use to connect with robots. When UX designers turn limitations into opportunities, the human factor isn't so limiting after all. Pretty cool, right? Coming up, we'll go through some of the psychological principles that act on the user's subconscious as they interact with a product. Hi again. Earlier, we introduced the concept of the human factor. Now, let's learn about other psychological phenomena that can impact UX design. Sometimes the human factor isn't as simple as lacking concentration or needing motivation. Human beings can be pretty complicated. We're always making associations between what we think and what we see. For example, humans usually prefer the color red over the color blue. Why? A 2005 study of the Olympic Games might give us a clue. For one-on-one -on -one combat style competitions like wrestling or boxing, Olympic rules randomly give one athlete a blue uniform and the other one a red uniform. Researchers discovered that Olympians in red won a statistically higher portion of their matches than those in blue. The study attributed these findings to the human tendency to associate the color red with dominance and aggression. Because of that association, the athletes wearing red were thought to be in a better mindset for a fight. Turns out, the right outfit really can make all the difference. But it's not just color preferences that make humans so complex. Every day, whether we know it or not, we experience examples of psychological phenomena. Let's check out some that can be especially useful to UX designers. The first psychological phenomena, von Restorff effect, or isolation effect, states that when multiple similar objects are present, the one that differs from the rest is most likely to be remembered. Think back to the childhood games you used to play. Remember those spot the difference puzzles? The puzzles were made up of images. Maybe there'd be a picture of three cows. The first two cows are white with black spots and look like pretty generic cows. They fit a young child's definition of what a cow is. But cow number three doesn't have any spots. 
The von Restorff effect tells us that the cow without spots, the unique cow, will be the one we remember. In UX design, this is why the call to action buttons look different from the rest of the buttons on a site or app, because we want them to stand out. In case you're not familiar, a call to action, or CTA, is a visual prompt that tells the user to take action. For example, the Start button on Google Maps is bright blue on a white background, which makes it stand out. The second psychological phenomena, serial position effect, says that when people are given a list of items, they are more likely to remember the first few and the last few, while the items in the middle tend to blur. This is why most applications and websites position the most important user actions toward the far right or far left of a navigation bar. The third psychological phenomena, Hicks Law, states that the more options a user has, the longer it takes for them to make a decision. We can experience Hicks Law in action in the potato chip aisle of any grocery store. Rows and rows of different potato chips. Even if you narrow your choice to one brand, you still have to decide between ridged chips or kettle cooked chips, sour cream and onion flavored or barbecue flavored, and so on. The options are endless, and so is the decision-making process. In other words, if the number of choices increases, the time to make a decision increases in proportion. As a UXer, you might think that giving your user a lot of choices enhances their experience, but Hicks Law tells us we may be making their decisions harder. It's important for UX designers to use these different psychological principles in an ethical way. You don't want to exploit the user. You only want to encourage them. You don't want to overpower the user. You want to empower them. With a little psychology, creativity, and empathy, what starts as a limitation can end up as a benefit. Coming up next, we'll move into the ideation phase of the design process. See you there. So that's a wrap. We've discussed the empathize phase in detail and have now entered the design phase. Along the way, we learned how to empathize with users, build an empathy map, understand user pain points, explore personas, write user stories, identify happy paths and edge cases, discover the benefits of user journey maps, incorporate accessibility and inclusion into UX design, and write problem statements and hypothesis statements. Next, we'll move into the ideation phase. See you there. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed learning about how to empathize with users and understand the design problem. Now we'll enter the ideation phase of the design thinking process, where we'll focus on understanding design ideation, conducting competitive audits, brainstorming approaches like how might we and crazy eights, and determining if we need additional research. Keep in mind, the ideation phase is where we transition from learning about users and the problem to coming up with solutions. Let's start by discussing what ideation means. As you might have guessed, the term ideation comes from the word idea. Ideation can be defined as the process of generating a broad set of ideas on a given topic with no attempt to judge or evaluate them. The broad set of ideas part is really important. Ideation is all about coming up with lots and lots of ideas, and the no judgment part is important too. We need to be able to explore all ideas without judging them and throwing them out. Some of the most crazy ideas can actually prove to be really valuable. For example, from the early to mid 2000s, mobile phones were getting smaller and smaller. The idea for a drastically larger mobile phone like the iPhone seemed crazy at the time. But history has shown that larger phones ended up meeting users' needs much better than smaller phones. Today, Companies that make phones brag about the large size of their screens, which is the complete opposite of the conversation 20 years ago. One of the best things about ideation is the mentality that there are no bad ideas. So if coming up with lots of ideas isn't your strongest skill, don't worry. Part of being a designer means intentionally exploring as many ideas as possible, knowing that some of them, or even most of them, won't work. Plus. The more you practice coming up with lots of ideas, the more natural it will feel. So what does ideation look like in the real world for UX designers? A designer, either individually or in a group, brainstorms out loud. 
every idea is documented, often on sticky notes or a whiteboard. The goal is quantity of ideas over quality, so share as many ideas as possible. No evaluation is allowed at this stage. If you're brainstorming in a group, make sure you gather a diverse team for different backgrounds and perspectives. Question the obvious. It can be difficult to question a common belief or practice if everyone has the same opinions. Finally, after you come up with a bunch of ideas, take a break. Then everyone should come back together to evaluate the ideas. When reviewing the ideas, it's important to have a reason for picking the idea you move forward with. There are a few common ways to evaluate your ideas. First, is the idea feasible? Is it technically possible to build? Next, is the idea desirable? Does it solve the user problem you're focusing on? And lastly, is your idea viable? Is it financially beneficial for the business? If an idea meets these three criteria, it might be a good option to move forward with. All right, so now we know what ideation is, what ideation looks like in the real world, and how to evaluate ideas. Up next, you'll learn why coming up with lots of ideas is so important. Enjoy. All right, so now we know what it means to ideate. But why is coming up with lots of ideas so important? That's what we'll answer in this video. To get our brain pumping, let's ideate solutions for this problem. Olivia is a parent who needs a way to ride her bike with her two-year-old Luca because he can't ride his own bike. There are lots of solutions to this problem that exist already, but let's imagine it's a new product. To solve for this problem, you could design a seat behind the adult rider, a seat in front of the adult rider, a bicycle built for two, requiring the child to pedal with the adult, a mini bike attachment for the child to ride behind the adult, a basket on the handlebars for the child to sit in, a sidecar like you might find on a motorcycle, a seat that attaches to the adult's helmet, or a covered trailer to pull behind the bike. Are some of these ideas ridiculous? Absolutely. But when you're ideating, you wanna push past the obvious ideas to get to the innovative ones. Remember, ideation is focused on coming up with a lot of ideas. Why? For one, the list of your ideas will be narrowed down when you have to think about constraints like budget and timelines. For example, your biggest idea might not be possible because of your team's budget constraints. You wanna start with a long list of potential ideas so that when constraints are introduced, you still have solutions that could work. In addition, we need to come up with ideas that are equitable. The first idea you come up with might be perfect for you as a user, but when we're designing with equity in mind, we want to make sure that the design works for everyone who will use the product. There are a lot of solutions to every problem, but we want to find the one that works best for your users, not you. Lastly, keep in mind that you might not be the one to decide which idea is the best solution. Instead, let users test a bunch of your ideas, and they might find the right answer. So, now that you understand why exploring lots of ideas is so beneficial, we can start the ideation process. Coming up, we will show you how to evaluate ideas based on business needs. Welcome back. We now know how to come up with lots of ideas and evaluate those ideas. As you ideate, it's important to think about the business you're designing for. This includes the business's voice, tone, and budget. That's what we'll focus on in this video, understanding the business needs behind design. UX designers often work closely with marketing and branding teams. That's because branding has a big effect on how users experience a product. Two major components of branding are voice and tone. Even though a brand isn't a human being, it still has a personality. Users don't want to communicate with a brand that uses robotic sounding language. Instead, users want to interact with a brand whose voice and tone sounds human and engaging. Here's the thing, voice and tone have a huge impact on a user's experience with a product. For example, imagine you place an order online for shoes and receive a confirmation email that says, great choice, your purchase should be landing on your doorstep in the next five days. Let us know how much you love it. When you order another pair of shoes from a different company, the confirmation says, Order shipped, estimated arrival, five to seven business days. The first email feels enthusiastic and conversational, 
while the second email feels cold and detached. Small changes in language communicate a brand's voice and tone and help improve the user experience. As we continue through this program, you'll see how design can help facilitate a conversation between a business and its users. For example, Apple and Google might each have a product that focuses on similar user needs, but the approach, tone, and branding for that product can be really different. In addition, we need to keep in mind the fundamentals of driving sales when designing. For example, imagine you are designing an e-commerce site. You want to make it easy to find the checkout button. This improves the user experience and drives sales. So your design benefits both the customer and the business. A win-win. Finally, it's helpful to research your brand's competitors as part of the design exploration. Knowing the successes and failures of your competition can help influence your design decisions. That might involve asking questions like, how do your competitors approach the checkout cart? Or what does your competitor's sign-up process look like? To recap, we need to consider both the business needs and the user's needs when designing. Next, we'll investigate our competitors, so get your detective gear ready. Welcome back. Did you get your detective gear? In this video, we'll explore an important part of the ideation process, competitive audits. A competitive audit is an overview of your competitor's strengths and weaknesses. We know that it's important to come up with lots of ideas before deciding on one solution. A competitive audit is just one tool to explore ideas for designs, so we can learn from others about what has worked and not worked. Let's begin by discussing what you can learn from a competitive audit. This includes identifying your key competitors, reviewing the products that your competitors offer, understanding how your competitors position themselves in the market, examining what your competition does well and what they could do better, and considering how your competitors talk about themselves. So, who do you consider to be your competition? To be thorough, you should include both direct and indirect competitors in your audit. Grab your magnifying glass. Direct competitors have offerings, meaning products, services, or features that are similar to your product and focus on the same audience. Essentially, you're both trying to solve the same problem. Indirect competitors are a little more nuanced. They either have a similar set of offerings but focus on a different audience than you, or they have a different set of offerings and focus on the same audience as you. For example, let's say you're creating a weight loss app that focuses on people in their 30s. Your direct competitors are other companies that also make weight loss apps targeted at people in their 30s. Your indirect competitors are any company that makes health or wellness apps targeted at people in their 30s, or make weight loss apps targeted at people in a different age bracket. It's helpful to audit a wide range of products that compete with yours to get a full picture of the landscape. In UX design, competitive audits are important for a few key reasons. Let's investigate. First, they help inform your design process. How did your competitors approach designing their products? Knowing what others have done can help you make better design decisions for your own product. Second, competitive audits help you solve usability problems. Is your competitor's website difficult to use? If so, you know what to avoid for your own website. Third, competitive audits can reveal gaps in the market. Are there user needs your competitors do not meet? Your product might be able to address these user needs. Fourth, competitive audits provide reliable evidence. Why is it important to gather evidence? Design ideas are most successful when there's a deep understanding of business needs and market gaps. Competitive audits are a huge part of gathering that information. Knowing all of these things can help you save time, money, and energy. I know we all want to be detectives, but who actually conducts an audit? Well, it depends on where you work. A smaller company might have a single UX designer conduct the audit, while a larger company might have an entire team to do the work. Either way, it's important for you to know how to put together a competitive audit because it's critical to your work as a UX designer. Now you know about competitive audits and their benefits, so you can put your detective cap back on the hook. Coming up, we'll explore some of the limitations of competitive audits. See you there. Hi again. 
Now that we've defined competitive audits and explored their benefits, we'll discuss a few limitations. Let's start with the biggest limitation first. Competitive audits can stifle creativity. If you spend too much time focusing on what others are doing, you might prevent yourself from creating a truly innovative product. Innovation doesn't happen by copying the competition. The key is to understand what the competition is doing and use that as a starting point to push forward and innovate. Another limitation is that the success of the competitive audit depends on how well you interpret the findings. Analyzing data can be tricky, and it's a skill that you'll develop throughout your career as a designer. Working on a team can be helpful here, as you'll have others to interpret the data with. Another thing to keep in mind while doing a competitive audit is that not all designs work in all use cases. The features that work well for a competitor might not work well for your product if you serve different users. For example, imagine you're designing a website for a clothing company. A competitor has a feature that shows photos of customers wearing their brand's clothing on social media. But if your audience doesn't regularly use social media, this feature is not a good fit for your clothing website. One last thing to call out. You should do competitive audits on a regular basis, not just once. You want to stay on top of what your competitors are doing and keep an eye out for new competitors that might emerge. All right, now that we've discussed why we do competitive audits and their limitations, coming up, we'll share the specific steps to take when conducting a competitive audit. Let's go. Welcome back. Now that you understand why we use competitive audits, let's go through how to conduct one. The first step is to outline the goals for your competitive audit. Make sure your goals are specific. It can help to break down your goals into the different product features you want to compare. For example, imagine you're reviewing three competing e-commerce websites. Your overall goal is to compare the features of the shopping experience on each site. If we broke that goal down to be a bit more specific, there are a few features you might focus on comparing. Customer reviews and ratings, return policy details, or delivery and in-store pickup options. Or imagine you're reviewing two subscription-based music streaming platforms. In this case, your competitive audit might focus on features like pricing options, browse and search functions, and creating and sharing playlists. As you might notice, your specific goals will differ based on the kinds of companies you review. So these two examples are just a small fraction of the goals your audit might include. Okay, now you've outlined the goals for your competitive audit. Next up, step two, create a spreadsheet with a list of your competitors. You should aim to include five to 10 competitors in your list. Some of the competitors should be direct and others should be indirect. As a reminder, direct competitors have offerings that are similar to your product and focus on the same audience. Essentially, you're both trying to solve the same problem. Indirect competitors either have a similar set of offerings but focus on a different audience or have a different set of offerings and focus on the same audience. Including both direct and indirect competitors in your audit gives a better picture of the full competitive landscape. With your list of competitors in mind, you're ready for step three. Call out the specific features you want to compare. This list of features should align to your goals for the audit. The names of your competitors are listed down the left side of the spreadsheet, and the names of the features you want to compare are listed across the top. Now that your template is all set up, you're ready for step four, research. Visit each competitor's website or app and take notes about their features. Remember to include details like what works well, what could be improved, and whether your competitor's features meet the needs of your specific audience. It's also helpful to take lots of screenshots and link to them in the spreadsheet. These will be important to have for your report and presentation later on. After you've collected all the information in your spreadsheet, it's time for step five, analyze your findings. Try to spot trends and themes. Ask yourself, what are the similarities between you and your competitors? Is there a certain feature that your competitors all approach in the same way? And finally, the last step in a competitive audit is to summarize your findings in a report. 
Your report might be a slide presentation or a document. It's helpful to include screenshots and simple charts or graphics. We'll go into more detail about how to present your findings later. And that's it. You now know the basic steps involved in conducting a competitive audit. Coming up, we'll go through an example audit step by step so you can get a better idea of how this all works in action. You're doing great so far. Congrats, you've successfully presented a competitive audit to your team. Knowing what the competition is up to has given you an edge. In this video, we'll talk about how to use learnings from your competitive audit to ideate. Let's take a step back and remember how competitive audits fit into the larger UX design process. As we've discussed, it's important to come up with lots of ideas before deciding on one solution. To explore ideas for designs, there are many tools you can use. A competitive audit is one. Let's take that one step further. How can we use the learnings from our competitive audit to come up with even more ideas? Try to bring together a team that can ideate from different perspectives, including designers, researchers, writers, and engineers. Now you're ready to start brainstorming. For example, let's say that two of your competitors have a difficult sign-up process. Is your product sign-up process easy? Can you update your sign-up process design to make your product stand out compared to competitors? As you come up with ideas for how your product can do better, you may even discover new strengths that your competitors haven't thought of yet. Once you've come up with lots of ideas, begin sorting them. You can group similar ideas together to uncover patterns, and a few ideas will naturally rise to the top. Your goal is to walk away from this brainstorm with a list of ideas that help your product stand out from the competition. All right, now you know the benefits and limitations of competitive audits, how to conduct a competitive audit, and how to use findings from your competitive audit to brainstorm new ideas. Coming up next, we'll explore value propositions. Hi, my name is Vanessa, and I am a user experience researcher at Google. So before becoming a researcher, I had a ton of different jobs, <laughs> um, more than most people can probably list in their career. <laughs> I was working at a library, then I decided to become a personal trainer. My first kind of stint into tech was essentially becoming an office manager at a startup. And so that was the first time that I was exposed to engineering and design and product management, but in a very, very limited manner. I did something very bold and essentially told the CEO of one of the small companies that I worked at that I don't want to be an office manager forever. <laughs> and so um, he ended up telling me, fine, let's figure out what you want to do. Um, you can learn more about the business. And he made me his executive assistant. And so that's how I got to start sitting in on meetings, understanding more about all the different roles within tech. And a year after that, decided that UX was going to be kind of the field that I want to be in. And so from there, I essentially looked into research, looked into design, started shadowing some of the designers, was taking design thinking courses, um, all different types of things just to get more exposure. And once I finally decided that research is the thing that I wanted to do, I got a master's degree. So I was working full time in school, part time. Um, and that was kind of my transition into UX and into research. So I always say research is like party planning. You have to just think of everything ahead of time. There are so many different aspects to it in order for both sides kind of to have a good experience, um, which I think is always super critical. It's like you don't want the participant to be uncomfortable. You don't want the researcher to be uncomfortable. Everything kind of leads up to you understanding um, people and processes. And I think with research, thinking about um, how to be empathetic, how to, I guess, have that metacognition of being able to recognize a situation, um, talk to any type of person, like, we don't necessarily choose um, who our customers are sometimes, but we need to be able to communicate with them and understand them. After being a researcher for a while, 
I decided to apply to Google. And I think that past experience, um, both in operations as well as in research, plus the, the degree, really helped set me up for success here. Hi again. Earlier, we explained why it's important to explore multiple ideas before settling on one solution. Using insights from competitive audits is one way to ideate. Now, let's explore another way to approach the ideation process, known as the how might we exercise. How might we is a design thinking activity used to translate problems into opportunities for design. Let's break that down. The word how encourages us to explore a bunch of ideas instead of moving forward with only one idea for the solution. The word how suggests that we don't have an answer yet. The word might emphasizes that our ideas are possible solutions, not the only solution. Finally, the word we suggests a collaborative effort. Coming up with ideas requires teamwork. Think back to our example from earlier. Olivia is a parent who needs a way to ride her bike with her two-year-old Luca because he can't ride his own bike. We came up with a lot of potential solutions to Olivia's need. Let's try coming up with some more ideas using the how might we exercise. For example, how might we design a seat for a child to ride a bike with an adult? Well, that's a fairly broad question. What about how might we design a safe forward-facing seat that attaches to an adult's bicycle so that a child can choose to ride or sleep while an adult rides on a mountain trail? Okay, that's too specific. Try this instead. How might we design a safe and comfortable seat for a child to ride a bike with an adult? The phrasing of that last question is what we're looking for during a how might we exercise. The question should be specific in describing the needs of the user, but still have room for innovation in the final product. This means the question is broad enough to leave space for solutions that might not be evident yet. As we know, during the ideation phase, we want to come up with a lot of ideas. So for this exercise, we want to come up with a lot of how might we questions, not just one. Coming up with how might we questions can be tricky. To help, the design school at Stanford University outlines a bunch of ways to create how might we phrases. Some of them include amp up the good. For example, how might we create a traveling experience for a parent and child to enjoy together? Explore the opposite. How might we design a bike for a two-year-old to ride with an adult instead of our original framing of an adult who wants to ride a bike with a two-year-old? Change a status quo. How might we improve public transportation options in Olivia's hometown so that she has options other than biking? And break the point of view into pieces. How might we make a two-year-old comfortable on a bike? How might we easily travel from point A to point B? There are more ways to reframe the problem covered in the course readings too. Asking how might we questions is just one way to ideate and approach a design problem. It might be incredibly helpful to you and your team, or you might find another exercise that works better. Either way, reframing the user's need as a question can help you think of your users and their needs in a new way. Next, we'll talk about another ideation process, sketching. Sketching is just what it sounds like, drawing your potential solutions to the design problem. Coming up, we'll go over a popular and useful way to sketch that's called Crazy Eights. Get excited. Hi, welcome back. So far, we've talked about ideation and how to come up with lots of ideas to solve our user's problem. Now it's time to start the fun part, sketching. In this video, we'll discuss why quick, simple sketches are critical in the ideation process. And you'll try sketching by doing an exercise called Crazy Eights. So this is it, we're ready to start drawing. For some of you, this will be your favorite part of design. For others, drawing can be a little intimidating. The good news is that we're going to create truly simple designs. In fact, your drawings don't actually have to look like anything in particular. Remember that in the ideation phase, we're just exploring lots of ideas, not trying to create something beautiful. So let me show you. Grab a piece of paper and a pencil or marker. 
we're going to practice sketching. Let's start by drawing basic shapes. Triangles, squares, and circles. Add in straight and squiggly lines. Sprinkle in a few stick figures of humans. You might need a bit of text as well. Here's a pro tip. Use all caps if your handwriting isn't neat and write horizontally so it's easy to read. Soon, when you're more experienced, you might switch from drawing basic shapes to drawing phone screens or websites so that your sketches look more realistic. But for now, just draw what you know. So there you go. You've learned to sketch. Simple, right? To learn more about the benefits of sketching and explore some techniques, check out the reading materials in the course. You might be wondering why we sketch by hand and don't do this on a computer where it's easy to copy and paste pre-made shapes. Well, you certainly can do this on a computer, but the point of sketching is to move as quickly as possible to record lots of ideas. Technology can sometimes hold us back when our hands want to move faster than our brains. So sketching by hand is a valuable skill for you to master. Remember our example from earlier, where Olivia needed a way to ride her bike with her two-year-old who couldn't ride his own bike? We came up with eight ideas to solve Olivia's problem. That process was basically a polished version of Crazy Eights. This type of ideation is a very common part of the design sprint process. In the ideate phase of a design sprint, the whole team might come together and do the Crazy Eights exercise. Crazy Eights lets you compare ideas, see everyone's different ideas, and narrow down the list of ideas before moving on with the best solutions. And don't forget, the best solution is always what your users think is best and not what you or your team thinks is best. Right now, to get started, you'll try the Crazy Eights exercise on your own. So the setup for Crazy Eights is easy. You'll need a large sheet of paper. Regular printer paper will work fine, but if you have something larger, that's even better. Fold the paper in half, then fold it in half again, then in half one more time. Now you have eight rectangles that are about the same size. Each of the eight spaces will be for a different idea. That's where the Crazy Eights name comes from, if you were wondering. Next, find something to draw with. A lot of designers like Sharpies because they create distinct lines. Or you might want to use a pencil so that you can darken certain areas. You'll also need a timer. The Crazy Eights exercise will take eight minutes. One minute for each idea. Any kind of timer will work. Your phone, Google search, or a wind-up kitchen timer. Finally, you'll need to refer to a problem statement. You'll sketch eight ideas to address that problem. To inspire you, let's go through an example based on a new problem statement. Charles is a retired grandfather who needs a way to keep his essential belongings with him because he often loses track of his wallet. I'll draw eight ideas for this one to serve as an example. Later, you'll do this exercise yourself. Remember, no idea is too wild, so I'll draw any solution that comes to mind. Here we go. Here are some of the ideas I came up with to address our problem statement. Let's walk through four of them. As a reminder, our problem statement was, Charles is a retired grandfather who needs a way to keep his essential belongings with him because he often loses track of his wallet. Sketch one, an alarm that goes off as Charles opens and closes his house's exterior doors to remind him to bring certain belongings, like his wallet, keys, and phone. Sketch two, 
a sign on his front door that says, remember to take these things with you. Place them here when you get home. Sketch three, a doormat with a checklist that says phone, keys, and wallet. Sketch four, and my personal favorite, shoes with false bottoms that he can keep a wallet in. Now you're ready to try Crazy Eights on your own. Try using a problem statement that we outlined earlier in the course, like this one. Amal is an athlete who needs a way to sign up for workout classes because the class he wants to participate in fills up fast. Or choose your own problem statement. Pause the video and start your timer. Remember, spend one minute on each idea and sketch possible solutions to solve this problem. Congratulations, you just did your first set of Crazy Eights. How did that feel? Were you able to come up with eight ideas? The Crazy Eights exercise is great practice for any design problem you need to solve. The sketching and ideating both get easier the more you do it. A great way to learn is to get feedback on your ideas. So if you'd like, take a photo of your completed Crazy Eights grid and share it on the discussion forum. Or do the exercise again with a different problem statement. Up next, we'll talk about how you can use the data you gathered in your user journey to ideate. You now understand how we use the How Might We and Crazy Eights exercises to come up with more ideas. It might seem odd that both these exercises are part of the same ideation process. After all, one method is practical and the other is more creative. With the How Might We exercise, you carefully considered a very specific user problem to create a list of questions. And with the Crazy Eights exercise, you sketched solutions to that problem with no limitations and no thoughts to practicality. Solving a problem requires both pragmatic and creative thinking. In this video, we'll consider how the user journeys you outlined earlier will affect your designs. As a refresher, a user journey is the series of experiences a user has while interacting with a product. Building off personas and stories, journeys help you think and feel like the user. Earlier, we defined this problem statement. Olivia is a parent who needs a way to ride her bike with her two-year-old son, Luca, because he can't ride his own bike. But we didn't actually create user personas for Olivia and Luca. As a refresher, personas are fictional characters that represent a product's user groups. They're created to identify a user's behavioral patterns. In the real world, we would have completed research before beginning our designs. For example, Consider the kid's bike seat that's in front of the rider. This is a pretty great solution for toddlers who are small but still strong enough to sit upright. But what if Luca were an infant? A small baby wouldn't be able to sit upright in that seat or wear a helmet, so it's not a safe solution for Luca. Or if Luca is much bigger but isn't able to ride his own bike because he has special needs or there's too much traffic for a child to ride alone, that seat arrangement won't work either. It's okay if a specific design doesn't work for everyone who shares Olivia's problem of needing a safe bike seat for her child. But part of the research process requires you, as the UX designer, to figure out who you're designing for and what their needs are. Olivia might need an entirely new solution. So think back to your user journeys for the problem statement you outlined and designed for. Did you keep those personas in mind while sketching? If not, Go back and add their stories and needs into your designs. Maybe you're not sure you have enough research to make the call on what solution Olivia really needs. In this hypothetical interview, did you forget to ask Olivia how tall her child is or what his specific needs are? And what about Olivia's needs? Some of our bike solutions from before could create an extra hassle for the rider. I'm looking at you, sidecar. If Olivia rides her bike on backcountry roads, that might work perfectly. But if she lives in a big city with designated bike lanes on busy streets, the size of the sidecar probably wouldn't be a good solution either. It's okay if you didn't ask the right questions. You're still learning. Plus, sometimes in the ideation phase, new blockers come up that never occurred to us before. If this happens, consider whether you have enough information to go forward or whether you need to go back to your research and collect more data. 
This work you've done, from writing user personas to mapping the user journey to exploring design concepts through sketching, is a great story to tell in your portfolio. It might not be a final project that you decide to share, but telling the story of the research, the problem, and the proposed solutions is good practice for the more detailed case studies you'll have in the future. And it's something employers might look for when reviewing your portfolio. All right, we've reached the end of the ideate phase. Let's review what you've learned. Understanding design ideation, conducting competitive audits, brainstorming approaches like how might we and crazy eights, and determining if we need additional research. See you soon. Guess what? You reached the finish line. You should feel great about that. Let's look back on everything you've accomplished in this course. You learned the basics of UX research and where it brings value within the design thinking process. You learned what it means to empathize with users and why it's important to do so before you start designing. You also explored personas, wrote a user story, identified happy paths and edge cases, and discovered the benefits of user journey maps. Next, you defined the user problem by creating problem statements and hypothesis statements. Finally, you started to ideate through the use of competitive audits and brainstorming exercises like How Might We and Crazy Eights. Plus, you continued working on your career growth by building your portfolio and updating your website with your latest designs. We'll keep moving toward a complete picture of the user journey in the next course, where we'll dive even deeper into the research portion of the design process. Knowing how to empathize, define, and ideate are foundational skills in UX research and in design. You now have everything you need to keep building on that knowledge going forward. Even more than the technical skills you've gained, you've shown your determination to succeed and your desire to help others two things that are super important in the UX design industry and will take you a long way in life too. I'm really proud of everything you've done so far. You've come a long way. It's been so wonderful being your instructor for this course and I can't wait to see what you do in the future. Good luck.